Hey, good morning, City Light. My name's Chris, one of the pastors here. We're going to be in Psalm 127, which was just read. And again, thank you for being here this morning. It's good to be in the room and uh, to take this time to turn our, our, our hearts, minds, and attention to Jesus and to his word. And again, 127, we're going to be, and I want to preach a sermon I'm titling, The Perspective You Need to Thrive in the Daily Grind of Work and Family Life. The Perspective You Need to Thrive in the Daily Grind of Work and Life. This is not a psalm today just about how we sing when we gather corporately or the, the, the methods of Bible study that we employ when we do life in community groups or um, our mode of baptism or communion or uh, our journaling and quiet time habits. This is primarily going to touch on the areas of our life that can kind of feel like a mundane and a grind. This is the nine to five. This is the, I'm waking up in the morning and going to work. This is I'm coming home and there's dirty laundry to do and messy floors to sweep up. This is where the psalm is going to touch our lives today, and it's going to remind us of of the wisdom and perspective we need on the daily grind. Now, before I jump in, let me ask you a question. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have have things ever gone far better or far worse than you expected them to go? Like maybe you stumbled through a lunch with a friend and they asked you for some advice and you felt like you gave kind of awkward jumbled advice. And then a couple of years later, they came to you and said, that advice changed my life, right? You know, that was like the awkwardest, weirdest lunch I've ever had, but somehow something good came about. Have you ever had a moment where something kind of unexpected like that happened? It just went so much better than you expected it to go. I, I have, and I've got a lot of stories about how things went way worse than I expected them to go, but we'll save those for another day. Uh, this morning, I want to talk about one that went way better than than I expected it to go. So um, eight years ago, there was no church. Gavin and I teamed up. We are friends. Uh, we are in our late 20s. Uh, we were starting to have kids and we looked at each other. We were both in college ministry. said, let's, w- what if there was a church in Omaha that it existed to exalt Jesus Christ for the sinner and for the saint? What if there was a church that, that existed to multiply disciples and churches? Like, what if there was a church that was more than just a, a place with programs, but a people with a purpose? Like, we started to get filled with this vision and desire to plant a new church in Omaha, AKA City Light Church. That was eight years ago. Now, here's the problem. Eight years ago, we didn't have a building. We didn't have no money. We didn't have no website. We didn't have no staff. We were just two dudes in our late 20s with nothing saying, I hope that the Lord does this. Now, at the time, there was four families involved in City Light Church. It was Gavin's family, my family's, and two other families. The tithing and financial dynamics were not really good. Okay, if you're doing the math, you got two people giving and two people trying to eat off that. So it was not a great dynamic. So one of our roles as church planners is we had to raise financial support. I had to tell people like, hey, you have money. We don't have money. You should give money. It's an amazing job. Okay, you guys like where this is going? Everybody's uncomfortable. Like, oh, snap. Is it giving today? Where are we going? Uh, No, relax. So uh, one of the things I did, and at the time we had this thing called a church planning prospectus. Maybe you've seen these. These are like the documents that are like, this is our vision and this is our mission statement and these are our methods and here's our plan and and this is what's gonna be true of our church. And it was glossy. And I can still remember we had it like professionally designed and we were so proud of it because we didn't have no church, but on paper it looked really good, okay? And so I would sit down with people at Starbucks or restaurants and kind of like say, hey, here's my story. Here's how I met Jesus. And here's this church I'm planning. Would you give money? And oftentimes people said, no. I love your idea, I love your passion, love your story, but we ain't got no money for you, okay? Uh, our money's going here, and we already invested in this, and this is just not a good time. And, and so I was just, this is where I was at. Now, I, I was doing everything I could to cast vision in a compelling way. I had language, imagine a church. I, I had a document. I was trying to do it the right way. I was sending out letters and making. And one day, in the middle of this time where we're raising funds to get the church going, I accidentally butt-dialed a woman who's a rancher in Northeast Nebraska that I have met one time, okay? One time in my life. Now, why do I have her number? It's because on a mission trip in college to an Indian reservation, I stayed overnight in her house with a group of college guys on the way to the mission trip. One night, we, we hung out in her house. And I, don't even, I, I didn't even think I still had her number. So it's one of those moments where your phone is ringing and you, you see the phone on the table with somebody's name on it and somebody says, hello. And then you kind of like awkwardly, like, do I hit hang up? Well, that doesn't feel very Christian-y. Like, what do I do? But then I pick up the phone. Oh, hey, 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 hey. And I don't know. Do I tell her? Actually, I just butt dialed you. I'm sorry. I didn't really need to talk to you today, you know? Or what do I do? Well, it just felt like, okay, well, she's on the phone. I'm on the phone. Let's just start talking. So I started asking questions. She's again, runs a ranch in Northeast Nebraska. So I ask about the ranch and how things are going and how are the cows? And, you know, I'm from the inner city. I don't know nothing about no ranch. I don't know nothing about cows. You know, like, <laughs> it's just, how the cows? You know, they're doing good now. They're growing up. What'd you name them? You know, I don't know. So, so we're talking about cows. 
And then I kind of, she's like, how's your life? I was like, yeah, we had a baby. We moved to Omaha. We're going to start this church with a friend called City Light. And, and by the way, like, I don't know, like you got money and we don't have money. So if you kind of want to give some of your money to the, like me, it'd be awesome. Because like, I don't really have any money right now, but you have money, you know? So like, what do you think about doing that? And <laughs> I just, I was so flustered. I was uncomfortable. I didn't know what was happening. I was just trying to make it through this awkward interaction. And I hung up the phone at the end of this interaction. And she's like, okay, yeah, we'll think about it. You know, I'll think about it and whatever. So what happened is I, I didn't expect anything. I was honestly just excited to hang up the phone and get away from whatever that interaction was. I had no expectation the Lord would do anything with that. So a few days later, I go to my mailbox. Sure enough, her name's on this letter. I open up the thing. And here's the story. A couple days previous to this, she had just sold a whole bunch of cows. And she felt, after she got my phone call, that the Lord was calling her to give the proceeds of that sale entirely to City Light Church and to this new vision. Is that amazing? Can you clap for that? That's incredible. Now, now what was my point? My point is this. I had tried strategy one. I had read a book on fundraising. How do you cast vision? How do you ask people for support? What do you need to say? How do you do it? What are the methods? What are the strategies? You got a phone, you got to send a letter, you got to have a document. None of it was working. I butt dialed a woman on a ranch in Northeast Nebraska that I met for 90 minutes one time. And she gave the largest check in the history of City Light. That's insane. Now, what's my point? My point is that you are not the point. That was my point. Nobody says amen. <laughs> my point is this, that so often we think that we're the point. If we got the strategy and the work ethic and the ability and, and, and the wordsmithing and we can make it visible and we can make it attractive, if we can work hard at our marriage and the discipling of our kids, if we, can, if we can just put the business plan together. And let me just tell you, that's not how it works. There's this thing called the God factor. And he's king and he's sovereign and he's all powerful and he does what he wants. And you can send all the letters you want and ask all the people you want, but guess what? God's got to move. God's got to move. And that's what I learned in that day, that it really wasn't about me. It was about the plan that God was writing. It was the story that he was authoring and he was going to provide for his church through he, who he wanted so that he would get the glory that he's receiving even in this moment. It wasn't that I convinced this woman or casted a compelling vision. I made an awkward phone call and stumbled my way through. But God moved in her heart to release resources for kingdom purposes. And the return on investment has been 500 plus baptisms for that lady. That is a solid return on investment for the gift that she gave. She shares in that spiritual fruit. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, so that's what I want to talk to you about today. That we serve a big God. And, and this is a big deal because... Um, I think in our culture, we, again, we can buy into this idea that it's about our work ethic and our effort and our methodology, but the Christian life isn't lived like that. Jesus said what? Apart from me, you can do nothing. We have been um, created to live in a posture of ongoing dependence on God. We need God to be God. We need God to work. We need God to show up. We need God to do something new. We need God to seek and save the lost. We need God to provide. We need God to protect. We need God to make a way. We need a big active God. And this God is not just involved in your salvation, which he is in a mighty way, and that he picked you, sought you, saved you, and will carry you to the last day, but he's involved in your daily grind. He's involved in your business. He's involved in your parenting. He's involved in your relationship. He's involved in building the house. So I want us to see today the bigness of God. And I want us to grow in our confidence in the sovereignty and the power of our all-knowing, loving, caring God. And I wanna show you guys how this plays out because if we're going to be people who live in a posture of dependence on God, who is king, who is ruler, if we're gonna be in a posture of dependence on him, we need to know some things to be true about him and his character. So I got two things I wanna show you out of this text. The first thing is this, is you can depend on the Lord in your working and in your resting because he loves you. You're gonna see that at the end of verse two. Let me, let me show you verse one, here you go. Here's what it says. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And Lord, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So the writer here is saying two different things. First, there's a builder, wakes up early in the morning, 
puts on his tool belt, gets in his truck, drives to work, constructs something, uh, swings the hammer, sweats, does a hard day labor, right? And then there's the watchman. They go to work late at night. Um, their, their job's not to build something, but the watchman's job is to protect what has been built. So a watchman was like the security guard. They would sit in the tower. They were wa- waiting for any, any enemies that would try to invade the territory. They would ring the bell. They would signal, hey, wake up. There's armies in the land. We need to be ready for battle. That was the job of the watchman. So you got somebody doing construction. You got somebody being a police officer in security, trying to protect. That's the two people. And it says that they are laboring, but their labor is in vain if God is not with them. Why is that? Why? Because all of our human effort, all of our working, all of our doing is secondary to the ultimate doing and working of God. It's God. He's all powerful. He holds the universe in his hand. He holds every structure together. And I wanna press this into us because maybe we've minimized our understanding of who God is. There's this unbiblical theology that says that God created the world and God will save your soul when you die, but everything in between is just kind of up to you to figure out, right? Like you gotta build the family, you gotta build the business, you gotta provide for yourself. And we can can think that God is somehow um, separated from his creation and either unwilling to intervene or unable to intervene, and neither one is true. Our God is able to intervene, and he is actively intervening in our life. He is sovereign, which means he brings about his will. And I want us to understand our role in work and rest, okay? That, that's my goal here today. But you, it's just like your identity. You're not gonna understand who you are until you understand who he is, okay? And in the same way, you're not gonna understand how we work and how we rest until you understand who God is. And so let me just for a second, can I have a little Bible study with you this morning? Because you might read this and be like, oh, we labor in vain. What what does that mean? It it doesn't honor my efforts. No, he honors your efforts, but it means that he's ultimate in the doing, okay? And I wanna show you how the scriptures would point us to the bigness of God. Can we do that this morning? Okay, one person excited about Bible study. I need more than one person or we're just gonna close in prayer and go home. Okay, here we go. Our God, here it is. uh, My first verse I wanna show you, Psalm 115. Our God is in the heavens. Look at this verse. He does all that he pleases. Some of y'all got married and thought that's what marriage was going to be. He does all. No, but the Lord, he does all that he pleases. Nothing holds God back. No armies intimidate him. No drama drama scares him. No demonic force binds him. He is unmatched in power and authority, and he does what he wills. He does all that he pleases. He is king in the kingdom. Number two, the heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. Proverbs 16, verse nine. How many of you guys made plans for 2020? <laughs> how that, how'd that working out for you? Yeah, you didn't get to go on that vacation. You hit that sales goal, right? We make plans and that's okay. We as a church make plans. We make quarterly plans. These are the big rocks we as a staff team wanna run at for the next three months. We make annual plans. Here's the big runs. This is how our, we're gonna financially budget. Here's the values. Here's the priorities. Here's where we're going for the next year. We've made five-year plans. Where do we wanna plant churches around the Midwest and beyond? We made plans. And you know what the Lord does? He looks at your plans and then he establishes his will and his ways in your life. You know what the big win for our church was this year, 2020? What was gonna be the big win for City Life Church? We as the elder team, pastoral team thought, you know what, we're planting three churches, which is not normal. A lot of churches never plant a church in their entire existence. We were trying to plant three in one year. City Life Mosaic, City Life Bennington, City Life Fort Collins. That's amazing, praise the Lord. And we thought, you know what, our role, yeah, you can clap for that. I'm I'm, I'm celebrating that. I'm a a little excited about what the Lord's doing. We thought, but as an elder, if we're gonna, it's like having babies. When you have babies, like I'm having, we have babies a lot right now in our little, our family. Um, when you have babies, you gotta keep everything else stable, okay? Because you can only absorb so much chaos in your life. And so as elders and pastors, we thought, you know, if we plant three churches and we just kind of like do groups and Sunday mornings, that's a win. And then COVID hit. And you know what? We realized we had a plan for the year, but the Lord had a different plan and he had a better plan. So what happened is COVID hit, uh, the city kind of shut down. Remember a whole lot of flattened curve. You got to stay home. The schools are shut down. The stores are shut down. There ain't no toilet paper in the city. Remember those days? Yeah. People are fanning. Oh, he's preaching now. Okay. Um, so, so I remember those days. And one thing we quickly realized is not um, how do we just do online church? That wasn't the question, but how do we bless the city was the question because there was a whole bunch of people who lost jobs immediately, businesses that were struggling, kids that used to go to schools to get meals for breakfast and lunch, and now there's none of that, right? And so we just threw it out to you guys. What, what if the church 
What if the church just responded to the needs of the city with mercy and radical generosity? And what if we collected food and distributed it to the poor among us in this season? And guys, for the last six months, you guys have delivered 60,000 meals. You've prayed over each one of those. Um, We've been a leader in the city in showing mercy to the vulnerable. Can you celebrate? That wasn't in the plan. That was not in the plan, but the Lord did that. One of the things that wasn't in the plan is what's gonna start on Monday. You're gonna hear about an announcement, but OPS closed. That wasn't in our plans. We didn't see that coming, but the Lord has an opportunity in that because the schools are closed, but the church is gonna stay open. And so in our midtown location, around around some vulnerable families, some single parents, some folks that don't have a whole lot of margin to absorb that kind of of, of disruption, we're gonna open up the building, provide a meal, provide some tutoring, provide access to the internet, provide some supervision, provide some safe space to be. Be, and that's amazing. It's going to be led by volunteers. We're opening up the church to be the church. That wasn't in the plans, but the Lord had a different plan. Um, we thought we were just going to do online gatherings this year. Or we thought we were just going to do in-person gatherings. I mean, just come. We got donuts. We got coffee. All that, all that went away. Now you got free mass. It's, be blessed. Um, so, um, but, but that's what we thought, right? And then the Lord had a different plan, and we took this online, not to market the church, but honestly, to serve the people who are vulnerable in our church that couldn't get here. And what has happened is that people all over the state who are hungry for the gospel are tuning in and growing in their relationship with Jesus, growing in their knowledge of God's word, hungering for the the presence of God in their life in new ways. And and that's happening not just in our state or our city, but dozens of states. We're seeing people um, jump in, start to write letters, say, thank you so much for what you're doing. We we tune in as a family. We're kind of isolated. Our church shut down. We don't have access to a local church that's not uh, closer than an hour away. So we've been tuning in and we've been so blessed by that. And that's happening not just in our state and our region, but handfuls of nations. People overseas are seeing this saying, God's doing a great thing in Omaha and you've been a blessing to me. That was not in our plans. That was not in our methodology. We, we weren't looking for a chance to do that. But the Lord has his own ways and he has brought them about and the Lord has established our steps. He's established our steps. So God is God, amen? God is God. Number uh, three, I wanna show you this last verse. And we know this. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. All things work together for good. All those who are called according to his purposes. So here's what he's saying. If you wanna know what God's doing, you can labor and you can work and and, and you can cultivate and you can build, but you have to understand that above all of that is the sovereignty of God who is working all things together for your good and my good and ultimately his glory, amen? Amen. And that doesn't mean it's gonna be convenient and easy. 2020 hasn't always been convenient and easy, but has not the Lord used these disruptions to maybe displace idols in our lives? Some stuff that we thought was secure isn't so secure and does it not make us come back to build our lives on the rock of Jesus Christ. And so he's working all things together for our good. And so in this text, what's happening here is um, maybe some of you guys are asking if it's, all about the Lord, if it's his glory, if he's the decisive one and we're not, um, then why, if the builder is building and the guardsman is watching, but ultimately it's the Lord who is sustaining, it's the Lord who is protecting, then, then why should we work the way that we work? What, what, what is our motivation in that? Well, first of all, it doesn't say stop going to work because the Lord is ultimate in decisiveness. That those workers are still working. The, the builder is still contributing. The watchman is still playing his role. And as Christians, you need to understand that we've been, we've been called, our God works, by the way. Genesis chapter one and two, did we not say the God that works? He worked to create. And then the scriptures would call us to work as his people. Uh, this is a good gift that the Lord has given us work and he's called us to work as unto the Lord, not to impress men or other people or just as a means to paycheck, but we have been called to work as unto the Lord. And so here's how the Christian works. We do our very best and we leave the results to God. We do our very best and we leave the results to God. If he's not in it, we can labor all day and it will be fruitless. It will be vain. I can preach all day. I can preach all day. I can get excited. I can tell jokes. I can try to entertain. I I can labor over this text and try to bring clarity to it. But I have come to learn that, that me preaching with passion, me preaching with conviction, that I can't preach your heart into an affection for God. I can't preach you out of hell and into heaven. I can't preach and make you from, move from death to life. 
I can't preach to help you uh, um, uncover the sin that's been hidden in your life. The Spirit of God has to do that. And so when I come in here, I don't come in here like, oh, I'm about to knock this one out of the park. I come in here low before the Lord saying, Jesus, you got to show up today. Or else I'm just making noise on a platform. I've come to learn this in my parenting. (laughs) I've talked about about this because this season of life I'm in and I'm a first generation Christian dad. And so I'm trying to figure it out as I go. And uh, you guys know, like at first you kind of think parenting is like a a recipe. Like if I just get the right ingredients and I just kind of take the right steps, it's all going to work out. And then you realize they're sinful and broken and rebellious. And like, and there's some things like I can do a new devotional and and I can try to model my walk with Jesus because my kids will not walk with the Lord unless Jesus Christ breaks into their story and makes them alive. Like I can't parent them into, I can parent them into behavior modification, but I can't behavior, I I can't parent them into heart transformation. Scriptures would say it's not by power or might, but by the Spirit, O Lord. Amen? But by your Spirit, O Lord. I wonder, I want to ask you the question, what a warning in this text. It says, are we laboring in vain? Are we laboring in vain? And that doesn't mean that we're just working and and it's, it's all vanity unless the Lord shows up. It means that sometimes we're doing a whole bunch of work, but there's nothing eternally significant to kind of come from it because we're not working for the Lord in view of the Lord. I want to ask you, what a warning. Have we grown um, really self-confident in our ability to do God's work apart from God? Have we tried to take him out of the equation? Have we tried to rest under the burden of it's all on me? I've got to lead, I've got to provide, I've got to make it all happen. Is it, is it on us or are we a people who are living in light of a big God who does what he wants and we depend on him? Let me show you guys verse two because it's gonna tell us what happens if we don't live in a posture of dependence on the Lord, okay? I wanna show you guys this, verse two, it says this. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Have you ever had a long day's work and you've labored all day and then you thought during the day while you're laboring and you're working, man, I'm gonna sleep good tonight. And then the night comes and what happens? You start to think, oh, dang, I still got stuff on my to-do list. Like, let me just open up this laptop, shoot off a quick emails. Let me just pick up my phone. I gotta text some people back. And then you're laying there in bed and you would think I would be exhausted from the day. But what happens? Next thing you know, you're, 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 you're thinking about every worst case situation, every worst case scenario in your mind. You're playing all this stuff out. You're thinking, which relationship's gonna fail? What business deal's not gonna go right? Which investment's not gonna go the way you want it to? And so there's all of those things happening. You're supposed to be sleeping and resting, but you can't because it's all on you and your mind is sputtering and moving and it doesn't even make sense and you're having completely irrational thoughts, amen? Nobody else has been there. Okay, cool, I'm the only one's messed up. That's fine, all right, that's good. Listen, what, what he's saying is, some of you guys know what it feels like to work with an anxious toil. There's this drivenness, there's this heaviness, there's this it's all on me-ness. And what scripture is saying is, no, 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 that's all vain. Like it's all in, like that's, that, that's not profitable. You're, you're restless because you're not trusting in the Lord. And so maybe if that's marking your work, work life rhythms, maybe we're not resting what the scripture has to say here. You know, the scripture is really clear, like to be a sluggard is somebody to be lazy, that is not honoring to the Lord. But this text is telling us to to overwork is no more pleasing to the Lord. And why is that? Because you're not trusting God to be God. You know, God is God. And so how do you rest as a Christian? How do you put your head down on the pillow and not stress out when there's still stuff to do on your to-do list? Still laundry to be folded, still diapers to be changed, there's still stuff to happen every single day. How do you put your head down to rest? Number one, I think you understand what verse one was telling you, that we as Christians worship a big God who holds the universe in his hand. And by the way, if you take a nap, he's not gonna forget to let the sun rise. Like he's got that. He's holding the stars and the moon in place. He's got the whole world and the universe in his hand. He is a big God who spoke the whole world into creation. He is sovereign over all things. He is unstoppable. There's no power that can restrain him. That's the God that we worship. I hope you have a big view of God and that should comfort you because he's not just a big God and you're just not a pawn in his plan. It says at the end of this text, he gives sleep to his beloved. Who are you, Christian? You are his beloved. And so Romans 8, 28 says that he's working all things for the good of those who love him and according to his purposes. Who are you? You are his beloved. 
You are his child. He loves you and he's promised, I will give you good gifts. That's who our God is. And so I hope you can see this. We can rest today because we know that our God is all powerful and he's personal. He loves us. And he's looking at you saying, you can take a nap. You can rest. It's spiritual. Go declare by sleeping that you trust that God's got this. Amen. Okay, a couple things. When you go to bed, I want you to say three things out loud or in your head. You might not say them out loud. People might think you're talking to yourself, but that's okay. Okay, here you go. Here's number one. I want you to say tonight, I'm not God. I'm not God. You know what? God is God. He never grows weary. He never grows tired. He's got it all. I'm not God. Guess what? God's modeled something for you. Work and rest. I'm not God. He's the creator of all things. I'm not. He never grows weary. I do. He never needs refreshment. I do. I'm not God. I have limitations. Number two, I need God. I can do nothing apart from God. I can't save myself. I need God. I haven't saved myself. I need God. My labor today or tomorrow will be in vain unless God uses me and works in and through me. I need God. Number three, I'm loved by God. I'm loved by God. I can rest tonight spiritually because I know I'm accepted and loved through the personal work of Jesus Christ. And I can rest physically because God loves me and is working for my good even while I rest. I'm his beloved and he is mine. As Christians, we work for the glory of God and we rest securely in the love of God. Is that not good news? Hey, Amen, that's good news to me. Number two, I wanna show you this. You can depend on the Lord for your family and future because he provides for you. You can depend on the Lord for your family and your future because he provides for you. I just wanna pause because I felt like when I was writing this message, there's some of you guys who are having jobs and they're real jobs and they're not that fun to go to and they're a real labor and you don't always love your boss, but it's a real grind and you're in it and there's real deadlines and real stresses and real pressures. Some of you guys are there. Some of you guys work in the home and honestly, you have the hardest job. My wife has the hardest job. It is nonstop chaos in the home. Um, there's a lot to do, diapers, dishes, um, parenting, discipleship, meals. It is no joke and it's not just a lot, it's mundane. It's every day, it's a grind, it's real. Some of you guys have little kids, you guys know what that's like. Some of you guys have teenagers and there's either dirty diapers or eye rolling and attitudes. You can pick your poison on that one. And you're here today and you love Jesus on Sunday and you love your Bible and you're ready to worship and you're ready to sing and you're so thankful for this place and you love God. But you know what? Sometimes we can lose perspective because at 3 a.m. when your kids wakes you up, when you're fast asleep asking you for a cup of water, that's a real moment. On Thursday, when you're taking your kids to soccer practice, you're running late, you're eating a fig bar, you're eating dinner on the run, and they tell you after 20 minutes of driving to practice that they forgot their soccer pads and shoes home, you about lose your salvation. <laughs> Friday comes, right? End of a long week, you've had your meetings, you made your calls, you got your stuff done, you've been grinding. All of a sudden, the teenager, they didn't talk to you all week long. They never want to open up. You ask them how their day, they just really, eh. Now all of a sudden it's 11 p.m. and they wanna get chatty about their feelings and you're thinking this was the one moment I just wanted to sit down, watch Netflix and do me. But instead, I'm now getting an opportunity to talk about your life and I don't wanna miss it, but it's a real moment. In those moments, it can be hard to have perspective on our families and kids. Can anybody say amen? Cause I'm, am I just preaching to me right now? Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, I'm telling you, there, there's moments where I, I, I love you, Jesus, but, but I'm not really, I've lost a little bit of perspective on what's happening here. So I just wanna teach us a little bit from the word of God. How do we view our kids and our families? Look at verse three. Behold, children are a heritage or an inheritance or a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a reward. I got a, a couple things I wanna say about this passage. The first one, this, children are a blessing. Children are a blessing. The Bible makes it very clear that children are not a burden, but a blessing. They are not just hindrances to your hobbies and your free time. They are a gift. Now, what's it saying here? They are a, a heritage, which is another word for inheritance, which another word for inheritance is a gift. It means that you didn't earn it and you don't deserve it. It's just coming at you and it's a blessing to you. Oh, I'm pro-inheritance, amen? And the Lord is saying, I'm just giving it to you. And he says, it's, it's, a, it's a reward from the womb. Now, who, who put life there? Who creates life? God alone creates life. And so you got... Life in your womb, life in your home, life in the next generation, you have been blessed. You've been blessed. And here's why we need to know this perspective because in our culture, there's a couple of perspectives on kids. One's a really low view of kids, right? You got a low view of kids. That's some people that just say, you know what? You might as well get a dog, don't get kids because that's like forever. It's like a real commitment. There's a lot of responsibilities, right? 
And there's a lot of people say, I'm gonna put off having kids because they're a burden and they're messy and they poop on themselves and they spill their milk. And, and who wants to be burdened with all of those responsibilities and duties? There's a low view of kids. It says, I, 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 don't wanna, I don't wanna give up my fantasy football and my hobbies and my free time for that. And there's a high view of kids where everything orients in the family around the kids. It's about their academics. It's about their, uh, it's about their athletic careers. It's about um, us getting a, driving some sense of purpose out of who they are, that, that's gonna make me feel good because they made the team and I didn't make the team, but they at least made the team. So now I feel better about it. Like everything's about the kid. It's no longer about the covenant marriage. It's about the kids. And it's, it's actually an idol worshiping where we're looking to our children to find what only God can do in us. And so there's a couple views on kids, but I, I, would, I would call us to, to have a biblical view of kids. Kids are a gift and they're from the Lord. They're not yours. My kids, I have four of them, they're not my kids. They're the Lord's kids. And you know what? I have a role in their life. I've been called, like every good gift that I get from Jesus, to steward that gift. I'm not the owner of that gift. I'm the steward who's been entrusted with that gift. And my role is to disciple them and discipline and teach them the ways of the Lord and ultimately not to make them D1 athletes or kids that get into um, an Ivy League school like Wayne State. (laughs) Big goals. But my, my goal is to point them back to the one who created them, made them, can forgive them, and sustain them. Amen? And so that, that's how we look at our kids. Kids are a blessing. That's what this verse is saying. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, a fruit of the womb, a reward. Now, let me show you guys the second thing I want to show you. Kids are God's means of care and protection for you. Let me show you this, verse 4. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior... I love that. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior. How many of you guys think your cute little adorable toddler is an arrow in the hand of a warrior? That's what the scriptures are calling it. I'll tell you what that means. Are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He will not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Here's what this means. Um, Kids are not just a blessing. Some of you guys are asking the question, really, why? You're still struggling with that question. Okay, it's easy to say that, but really, why are they a blessing? The psalm is actually going to tell you, here's how it works. Listen, parents, guess what? You spend a lot of your life as parents trying to protect your kids, don't you? Like, you you protect them from people with weird mustaches and conversion vans, don't you? Right, right? Like, you you protect them from that bully that walks around with swagger and always has something to say to your kids. You protect your kids. You protect them from playing in traffic. You protect them from running uh, with sharp objects. You protect them uh, from fire. Like, you're always trying to protect them from a bad relationship, a bad friend, something that can harm you. And you're using all of your strength because your kids come into this world dependent on you right? You are God's means of grace to your kids. You are a barrier of protection. It's on you to help. I'm not even going to get into how we need to be protecting our kids from what's on the internet with their phones. That's a whole nother sermon. But you got to protect your kids, not just from a bully on a block nowadays. You got to protect them from some stuff that's coming after them, okay? And so we as parents protect. That's our role. But then guess what happens, parents? You get old. (laughs) You're going to get weak, You're going to be vulnerable. You're going to grow tired. And in that moment, guess who's aged and grown strong? Your boy has become a man. Your daughter, a woman. You've got son-in-laws. Why? Because as you age, God's design for the family is that they would now care and protect you. Your children are like an arrow. An arrow is not a cuddly doll. An arrow is, is is a means of protection for battle. Like what, it, what the imagery here is, let's say you want to harm me. I've got a bow in my hand. Now I'm an older man now. I'm 55, 60, 70 years old. I, I look a little bit older than I am right now. If you want to come at me, I got a bow in my hand. I got a quiver. I got four or five arrows and they're ready to be deployed at you if you mean me harm. What the scriptures are saying is God's design for the family is that the generation that you're protecting will one day love and protect you that they're dependent on you right now, but at some point you will be dependent on them. And it's the Lord who will use your kids who you're laboring to protect you. Is that not an amazing, beautiful imagery from scripture? Here's what it also says. You will not be put to shame when you speak with your enemies in the gates. You know what that means? The city gates where the people of God would would do justice. It's like the courthouse. It's it's the courtroom. It's where people, if they had accusations against you, this stuff would get worked out. And it's saying, you're not getting put to shame in that place 
because your children are gonna be there and they're gonna say as a testimony, that's not true of my mom and dad. I've seen their sacrifice. I've seen their love for the Lord. I've seen their faithfulness. I've seen their integrity. You won't be put to shame because you've got people who are a testimony to who you are and to your steadfastness. Now, let me just pause right now and celebrate a couple things. In our church, I just wanna say, I've watched some of you not just raise your kids. You're here and you got your arm around your wife. Your kids have already been deployed. They're in college, they're young adults, they're all over. But guess what's happening? You're not just living the high life because you don't have babies. All of a sudden, your parents are starting to age. And I've watched you City Light Church, so many of you with aging parents, and the way that you've loved your aging parents, even though they've been imperfect towards you, they weren't perfect, but that hasn't stopped you from loving and honoring them. And I wanted to say, that is good and God-honoring. That is a beautiful sacrifice for you to hold your mom and dad's hand, for you to speak life and blessing into them, for you to help them move, for, for you to encourage them, for you now to understand that you get to play the role of protector, that even in a season where they might be vulnerable or sick or growing weary and tired, that you would walk alongside them like they have walked alongside you. That is a beautiful thing, church. Thank you for modeling that season well to me as a younger man. And may I pick up the baton of faithfulness where you've left it. I think this principle doesn't just apply to the nuclear family, but the spiritual family, the church. The, the bigger principle here is that God is the ultimate protector. His means might be his children for us as we grow old, but in the church, in the church, we are same, we are a spiritual family, and we treat the older saints around us as spiritual mothers and fathers, and we walk with the vulnerable, and we protect the weak, and we honor the spiritual heritage that they've laid down before us. And so at City Light Church, we, we walk with the senior saints. In our culture, we just have to be very honest about how our culture sees seniors. Sometimes they don't see them in the highest regard, but the church treats them with dignity, love, respect, and honor. We don't look to take from them, but to continue to give to them. So let me just close with this. I wanna close with this. I, I just get this sense that it's easy for us to check the box and say, I believe this, but my hope, and my hope for us today is that we wouldn't just believe this, but it would start to affect our behaviors. Like, I get this sense that, that it's easy to just kind of maybe take some notes, but I, I wanna know what would it look like for us to actually apply this? So like this week, what if this week we walked into our workplaces not with anxious toil on our bones, not with a heaviness, not with a weightiness, not with a, I've gotta perform, I, I gotta beat you, I, I gotta outdo everyone, I gotta make this happen. But what if there was a lightness to our step and a smile on our face because we know that all the real work that has to get done from beginning to end, Jesus Christ is gonna do. What if we got to turn work into worship, not a place where we worry? What if joy and peace marked our countenance before others? Would people not see Jesus in us? And what if we came home and slept? Slept, and we slept well. Like what if we weren't just restless in our beds at night? Would that not set an example for our kids or roommates or our spouse that we are centering our work and our rest on the Lord and we are doing our best, but we're surrendering to him? And what if in a culture where it's kind of popular right now to grumble about our kids, how hard it is, how stressed out we are about them, how we're worried about them, how they'd made a bad mistake, how they had a bad friend. What if we were parents that said our gifts are a gracious gift from God and we believe that God has kingdom purposes for them and they're imperfect, but that many of them are under the grace of Jesus Christ and we're praying that they would not just grow up to be strong physically, but they would grow up to be strong in the Lord like, what if we had a different narrative around our families and we made it our joy, not just to raise great athletes or great students, but our joy to make great disciples in the home? Would that not stand out in our neighborhoods? And, and what if we as a church never graduated from dependence on God? For me personally, we started with nothing as a church. Now we got a couple buildings. We have a lot of money in the bank. We're doing okay. We got a big staff team. They got cameras now. They got timers telling me I went too long today. I mean... They're gonna tase me in about 30 seconds. Um, but you know what? My hope is that we would never grow dependent on God because there would not be another round of baptisms in our church unless Jesus Christ seeks and saves the lost. That there will, there will not be another church plant unless the Lord comes and raises up later. Uh, th then there will not be a marriage that's restored unless the Lord softens hearts. Like we are in a posture of dependence on God and may that always be our posture. Let's pray. Jesus, I wanna say thank you. Um, that apart from you, um, we can do nothing. But with you, you promise that some of us are gonna see just incredible things. And so, Lord, I just wanna say thank you, Lord, for this, this humbling text that reminds us of the bigness of God. There's been a God factor to my life. 
There's been a God factor to so many people's lives in this room where we can't explain the blessing on our lives, the way you've provided and you sustained, you've protected us, you've opened up doors when we didn't feel like there was one, you've made a way. And so Lord Jesus, we just simply wanna say thank you. Um, We can't explain it, but Lord, you've been working for our good and your glory in every season of our life. And we just wanna declare today that at City Light Church, we wanna be a people that depends on you in our workplaces, in our Sunday morning gatherings, in our parenting, in our family life. Lord, you need to rule and reign and we're dependent on you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.